Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessed day that we've had today, and we thank you for bringing us here safely to another Sabbath. As the Sabbath hours begin, please open our minds, guide and direct us, help us to understand what we cover tonight. Please draw each one of us closer to you and help us to keep your Sabbath hours holy. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, last night we put some groundwork in place, looked at a few basics that most everybody was already familiar with. Tonight we're going to put a few more pieces in place and start building this picture, this puzzle that we're working on. Psalm 77, 13. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Now there's countless lessons that we can learn from every little single detail of the services of the sanctuary and the sacrifices and all the different procedures that were gone through while they were performing the sanctuary service. In fact, if you study out the subject of the sanctuary, you will discover that everything from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 is written in sanctuary language. But today, I'm mostly going to be focusing on the furniture and the layout of the structure of the sanctuary itself. Okay, this is the biblical model of salvation. Now, we understand that the Ark of the Covenant represents God's throne. So, this is where Christ began. Christ started out in heaven. But then, Christ came to the earth, brought it into this world as a human, took on the human nature, came as a baby, and he grew up in this chamber. Then, he came to the laver, which represents baptism. Then, he was crucified here on Calvary. Okay, so here we see Christ's path to come get us. So this is the pathway of Christ in providing the atonement. Now if you go in reverse order, here is the foot of the cross. This is where we repent of our sins at the foot of the cross. So this is the first step. Once we come in the door, we come to Christ right there. That's the repentance. And then following that faith that we're given a little bit of, we follow Christ in his example and then we're baptized right here at the labor. Then we move on in to the growing up process. This is our works. Here you have the table of showbread. It's the bread of life. Christ is the bread of life. But this also represents the word. So here you've got our daily bread. It's our study of God's word. So it's our daily Bible study. Over here, you have the incense. And the incense represented the prayers of the saints. So here you have represented our prayer life. So here you've got the daily Bible study and our communication with our Creator. And here you have the candlestick, which is the light that provides light to the world. So the candlestick is representing us sharing what we've learned with everybody else. It's our witness. It's our light. So that's our works. That's our growing up process. Now, the courtyard out there where we come to the cross and we repent and then we're baptized, that represents the justification process. That's an immediate thing that takes place. The holy place represents our sanctification process. It's the work of a lifetime. It's a day-by-day -day process. And the most holy place represents perfection or glorification. That's when we're finally restored back to God's kingdom in heaven. So here you see the pathway of the believer in appropriating the atonement that Christ provided for us. So notice that there's a path both directions. Okay, if you look in John 10 verse 9, and he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So if you look back in verse 7, he says, I am the door of the sheep. And if you look on back up at the top there at verse 1, it makes it clear that he's talking about the sheepfold. Now the interesting thing about this is that the word sheepfold is translated from two different words. The first word is probaton, and it literally means something that walks forward, a quadruped. That is specifically a sheep. The second word is ale. And it means a yard as open to the wind. By implication, a mansion, a court, a fold, a hall, or a palace. 
So this word that's translated sheepfold, this is sanctuary language. It's actually describing a court in which something like a sheep passes. So this is a court that's open to the wind that a sheep is progressing through. And as we've just seen, you've seen how the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, progressed through this court. And you've seen the path of how God's people, who are also represented as sheep, progress back through. So when he's talking about he's the door of the sheepfold, it's talking about the sanctuary. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So now we see that here's the sanctuary, and Christ in the other verse that we read said he's the door. But we see that there's three doors. And then here he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what he's just done is he's just given us the names of the doors. So here we have the first door coming out of the outer world here into the sanctuary. This is the way. The only way for us to ever get to heaven is Christ. He's the door. He's the way. Notice that the second doorway here at these five pillars, this is truth. If you look up 1 Timothy 2.4, Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? So we see that knowledge is linked with truth. You can't have truth without knowledge. So here at this second door, we have the truth. We have knowledge represented. Okay, now the third door, according to this list here, what's the third door? Life. The third door is life. This is the only way to get to the Father, is to come into the way, the narrow way, to gain a knowledge of the truth and to come to the life. John 17:17 17, 17 says, "Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth." So here you see this sanctification which is in here in order to be sanctified, they have to come through the truth. They have to come through this doorway of truth and knowledge. Okay, so let's look at another verse. Isaiah 66, 1. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? Now we've already seen that the most holy place represents heaven. Represents the place where God's throne is. And the courtyard where Christ was baptized and then crucified represents earth. But if you go back and look at the description of the sanctuary, there were angels embroidered on the veils and on the covering of this whole structure here. So if we look at the angels being here and here, then we suddenly get an understanding that this whole thing is heaven. But now there's something else that's interesting in this. Because out here, in this courtyard, what was the ground made of? It was dust. It was dirt, which represents man, represents earth. But we also know in the holy place, the ground was also made of dust. Because if a woman was suspected of cheating on her husband, the priest would take dust from the floor of the holy place and mix it in water and have the woman drink it. And if she was innocent, then nothing would happen to her. But if she was guilty, her stomach would rot. Her belly would rot. And so we understand that there was dust in the holy place, which makes this earth. You'll notice that here in the holy place is where heaven and earth overlap. What do you think that is? John 17, 14 to 17. Christ says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So we see 
in that illustration where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be in that sanctification chamber. We're supposed to be there in the holy place. Even though we're part of the world, we're to be separate from the world. We're to be, we're citizens of heaven. We're to be in heaven. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Okay, so let's look at the sanctuary and see how our body fits into this category. Each human being consists of three parts. You have the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. That's what makes up a human body. The spiritual in the human body is your frontal lobe. That's where you make your decisions for right or wrong. And you'll notice that it's in the same structure as the mental. So this is the human mind right here. So you have the physical body, which is the water, and the flesh and blood. That's what constitutes our human body. And then you have the human mind. You'll notice that there's a barrier between the physical and the mind, the mental and the spiritual. So in the natural world, what is the barrier between our physical body and the mind? It's the five senses. The five senses are a barrier that protects our mind from the physical world. It's vitally important for us to understand that if we're not protecting our five senses, then Satan has access into our mind. Luke 12:52. it says, And from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. So here we have a house, and there's three against two, and two against three. Now, do you realize what that's saying? Because we already understand that this is the physical, and this is the mental. So here we have a description. Now, I'm not saying that's the only meaning of this verse. There's a lot of meaning to that verse. But when you plug it into the sanctuary, it's describing a battle that goes on between our mental, what we know to be right, and the, our physical wants. Well, we want to do that, but our mind says, no, that's wrong. So there, there's a mental battle taking place here. Two against three, three against two. Okay, now just remember these five senses. And if we compromise any of those five senses, the devil has access. All right, now look at Isaiah 14, 12 to 13. This is God, and he's talking about Lucifer. And he says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now to get a full understanding of these boastful words of Lucifer, we need to understand something. Lucifer started out here. He was the covering cherub. But when he fell, he fell to the world. He fell out of heaven. And what he's saying in these boastful words is that he will ascend back into heaven and he will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now where was the north? Table of showbread. That's the only thing that's sitting on the north side. Now the interesting thing about this, if you go through and study out this mount of the congregation, that was what the Jews referred to the sanctuary, the temple mount. That was the mount of the congregation. When Christ was resurrected and after 40 days, he returned to heaven and he sat down on the right hand of the Father. And we understand that that's where he was up until 1844. Here you have a representation where Christ came to the holy place and he sat down on the throne beside his father. And he also said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Now, who was Christ? He was the bread of life. 
So here's two stacks of bread. They're both identical. You have the Father and the Son sitting side by side on the throne. So up until 1844, this is the throne. Now, Satan can't cohabit a throne with God. But after 1844, the Father and the Son got up and came into the most holy place, which leaves an empty throne. So just looking at what we know of this, that tells us that what Satan is planning on doing, the focus is sometime after 1844. Now we know that Satan can't literally go into literal heaven and sit on a literal throne. He's been banished from heaven. But we already saw how this represents the human mind. So here is Satan. He's not actively working on trying to get a literal throne in literal heaven. What he wants is a throne in your mind. And that's what he's aiming for. So we see that this tabernacle structure represents a mountain. But we also see there's another mountain out here because Calvary was on a mountain. So you have two mountains, a mountain here and a mountain here. Now what does every set of mountains have between it? A valley. So there should be a valley in here, right? Joel 3.14 says, Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So when you plug that text in, you suddenly discover that here at the five senses, in that area, you have a decision process taking place. And we know that we're supposed to be guarding our senses. So here is a decision that's taking place where we have to decide whether we're going to guard our senses or not. Now, the interesting thing about this is that if you remember the story of David and Goliath, who does David represent? Jesus Christ. Remember, he was born in Bethlehem. There's a, there's a whole lot of parallels between David and Christ. David and the Israelites were on one mountain, and Goliath and the Philistines were on another mountain. And when David went down the mountain to the brook and gathered five smooth stones and then ascended the other mountain to meet Goliath, who represents Satan. So here you have the story of David and Goliath portrayed in the sanctuary. Now, there you have David representing something good that takes place with five smooth stones. But now remember, in the Garden of Eden you also have something taking place with five senses. You have Eve, and what did she do? She compromised her five senses. She saw the fruit. She listened to the snake. She touched the fruit. She tasted the fruit. And we all already know that smell is highly connected with taste. So Eve compromised all five of her senses. So Eve, she was created perfect, but then she compromised her five senses and she ended up outside the garden. Speaking of that, let's look at the sanctuary structure because it reveals the structure of Eden. We always think of it as the Garden of Eden, but it was actually, if you go back and look at it, it says God placed a garden in Eden. So Eden was bigger than the garden. So you actually have right here the garden and the courtyard representing Eden. Now we know when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden that the gate was on the east side. We also know that the antediluvians would come to the gate and they would build their altars and worship God. The, the antediluvians that stayed faithful to God would worship God there at the gate to Eden. So there you've got an altar built at the east gate where they worship God. This is Maranatha, page 354. At the cherubim guarded gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Hither came Adam and his sons to worship God. 
Here they renewed their vows of obedience to that law that transgression of which had banished them from Eden. So there she's talking about them coming to the gate and building their altars and worshiping God. Remember the names of the doorway? You had the way, the truth, and the life. Well, remember in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. You had the tree of life, and you had the tree of knowledge. So here you've got the way, the truth, or the knowledge, and life. We also know from the Garden of Eden that a river flowed out of the garden, if you look at the descriptions, and when it flowed out of the garden, it split into four, and it watered the whole earth. Now, we have another quote here from Review and Herald. It says, Adam had themes for contemplation in the works of God in Eden, which was heaven in miniature. Okay, so let's take a look at this sanctuary, because it's a layout of heaven. You have Mount Zion, or the Lord's house, mountain of the Lord's house. Now around Mount Zion, Sister White says that it, Mount Zion is here and it's surrounded by seven hills, seven mountains. Mount Zion was just before us and on Mount Zion set a glorious temple and about it were seven other mountains on which grew roses and lilies and I saw the little ones climb or if they chose use their little wings and fly to the top of the mountains and pluck the never fading flowers. So here you have a mountain surrounded by seven other mountains. We also know that this is the throne of God. Now what comes out of the throne of God? It's the river of life. We know from the description that the river of life flows through the tree of life. We have a description that it has two trunks. Remember that at the crucifixion, that veil was torn in two. So at heaven, we have two trunks. So you have the river of life that flows out and goes through the gate. And it comes out here and it connects to the sea of glass. In Solomon's temple, the laver was called the sea. So here you've got a description of heaven portrayed. And actually, if you look in Ezekiel's description of the temple, he talks about water coming out from under the walls. When Ezekiel's seeing the temple, he's actually seeing the literal temple where water is actually coming out from under the walls. The laver was made of looking glasses and it was called the sea. So you have the sea of glass. I'm going to read a statement and it was so long I didn't put it on the slide. This is from Testimonies Volume 1, page 60. She says, soon our eyes were drawn to the east. All right, where is east? Our eyes are drawn to the east. For a small black cloud had appeared, about half as large as a man's hand, which we all knew was the sign of the Son of Man. In solemn silence, we all gazed on the cloud as it drew nearer and became lighter, glorious, and still more glorious, till it was a great white cloud. Okay, so here is Christ. If we see him in the east and he's coming to get us, which direction is he traveling? West. Which is what? It's the path of the sanctuary. He's going to pick us up and take us the path of the sanctuary. She says, we all entered the cloud together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass. When Jesus brought the crowns and with his own right hand placed them on our heads, he gave us harps of gold and palms of victory. Here on the sea of glass, the 144,000 stood in a perfect square. The altar of burnt offering was a perfect square. So here you have a representation of the 144,000 standing on the sea of glass in a perfect square. The four horns representing the power, four being the number of Christ, Christ's power in the 144,000. Okay, it says, We were all clothed with a glorious white mantle from their shoulders to their feet. Angels were all about us as we marched over the sea of glass to the gate to the city. Jesus raised his mighty glorious arm, laid hold of the pearly gate, swung it back on its glittering hinges and said to us, You have washed your robes in my blood, stood stiffly for my truth, enter in. 
We all marched in and felt we had a perfect right there. Within the city, we saw the tree of life and the throne of God. Out of the throne came a pure river of water. And on either side of the river was the tree of life. So here she's just described what we looked at basically going in reverse order in the sanctuary. Now if you look at this river of life flowing out to the sea, what is the sea used to represent in the Bible? People. Revelation 17, 15. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So here we see people flowing out to the sea. Isaiah 2.2 2 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. Remember, this is a mountain surrounded by seven other mountains. And all nations shall flow unto it. So here it's talking about people flowing back to God's throne. Do you recognize these two paths from the first lesson here? Now remember, Satan has a counterfeit for everything that God does. Satan takes what God has and he flips it around and makes a total counterfeit of it. So let's look at Satan's counterfeit. You'll notice that here, God has a city that sits on a river. And what does the devil do? He also has a city that sits on a river. You'll notice that Mount Zion is surrounded by seven mountains. And Rome is the city of seven hills. It was built on seven mountains. You'll also notice that the city of God sits on the river of life. But the city of Babylon sat on the Euphrates River. So here's two cities and you have a river that flows through. If you look at the Euphrates, according to Deuteronomy 1.7, it calls it the Great River. And that's actually what the name Euphrates means, the Great River. Does that make you think of anything? The Broadway. It's broad. It's great. And we know that there's a difference between the narrow way and the broad way. Now, what's even more fascinating here is that the Euphrates has two sources. The first is called the Black River. That's its real name, and that's what its interpretation is. It's called the Black River. The second source for the Euphrates River is the River of Desire. So look at the spiritual lessons you get. The river that's supplying Babylon has two sources black, which is sin, evil, and desire. Now if you look at this, you have this river, and we know that the river of life flows from the throne of God out. So which direction is the current flowing? It's flowing east. So here you've got a river that's flowing out of God's kingdom and flowing in to Satan's kingdom. And the current is flowing this way. Now, if you look at a regular river with a strong current, how can you go this direction, back up this river? You have to go against the current. The easiest route is to just float with the current. And where is floating with the current going to take you? To Babylon. So you have to be going against the current. Now, if this is a strong current, it's pretty much impossible for you to swim against the current. And after a while, you're just going to get tired and drown. So how would you get back into this place against this strong current? The only way to get back in here is if you can walk on water. Do you remember a story of somebody that walked on water? Peter. And what did Peter do that allowed him to walk on water? Kept his eyes on Jesus, which we would call what? Faith. Faith was what enabled Peter to walk on water. And faith is the only thing that's going to enable us to walk on that river back to the throne of God. 
Matthew 14, 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now look at this quote here. This is from Christ Object Lessons. She says, when one has to swim against the stream, there is all the force of the current driving him back. Let a helping hand be then held out to him as was the elder brother's hand to the sinking Peter. Speak to him hopeful words, words that will establish confidence and awaken love. So she even likens the swimming against the stream and the force of the current. She links that with the story of Peter. In other words, when Peter was exercising faith in Christ, he was able to walk on water. But when he changed his heart and he took on presumption and he looked back, that's when he started sinking. So presumption, which is Satan's counterfeit of faith, will drag you down and drown you. Okay, now that we've got some of these pieces laid into place, hold those thoughts in your mind because I'm going to switch gears and you guys might think that I'm totally going off on something else but don't worry because before I'm done I'm gonna bring it back and I'm gonna tie these thoughts together so how many of you like to do puzzles I'm going to take you on a little journey and show you how God started teaching me some stuff. He took my life full of a bunch of puzzle pieces and he said, here, I want you to stand there and watch as I start putting these puzzle pieces in place. This is Christ Object Lessons, page 219. The Savior was a guest at the feast of a Pharisee. He accepted invitations from the rich as well as the poor. And according to his custom, he linked the scene before him with his lessons of truth. So what she's saying here is that Christ's custom was when he would see something in the physical world, he would link it with a spiritual application. This is Review and Herald, February 2, 1886. There are many youth who, because they cannot find happiness in plans of their own devising, will not accept it in God's appointed way. They wander over their unhappiness and count their best friends, those who discern and point out their deficiencies, their enemies. They cling with tenacious grasp to their impressions and their ideas of what they must have and what they must do in order to be happy. But they lose sight of the fact that it is the Lord who rules and it is He who shapes circumstances. He says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Finite beings should be humble and submissive in their desires, realizing that God uses many influences which it is beyond their power to control. Okay, so we see here that the Lord is the one that shapes circumstances and that he uses influences which it's beyond our means to control. Job 6.24 says, Teach me, and I will hold my tongue, and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. And Psalm 27 verse 11 says, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in the plain path because of mine enemies. Now, what's another way that God uses to teach us? This is from Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students. The whole natural world is designed to be an interpreter of the things of God. Okay, so when you see something in the natural world, it's there to teach you something about the spiritual world. You'll also notice that when Christ taught in parables, he used the physical world. He would teach there's a sower in the field and he would tell that story and he would draw spiritual applications from it and this is the way that little children would like to sit there and listen to Christ all day because he used things in the physical world to illustrate spiritual lessons Matthew 18 3 and verily I say unto you except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now because of the listed side effects of the drugs that were forced on Trenton at the hospital, 
Before he died, he lost most of his eyesight. He lost a big portion of his hearing. We literally had to shout in order for him to hear us at all. And he couldn't see anything. This made me think of Revelation 3, the description of Laodicea. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It seemed to me that every time that Trent would begin, he'd have a, a turnaround, he'd start to get better, but then it would go back and he'd get worse. And it was, it was this constant, this battle, which is interesting because if you look at Laodicea, it's a constant battle. So this went on for quite some time, and as you can imagine, I was getting really, really frustrated. And one day I had just about had it. And so I went storming out of the house and took off up the mountain behind the house. And I decided I was going to give God a piece of my mind because I was just sitting there watching my son just waste away and die. And it was like he was just being tortured. And so I went storming off up the mountain and I was literally shaking my fist at the, at the sky. And I said, I said, why are you doing this, God? Why are you allowing him to lay here and be tortured like this? And you ever had God tell you something? It was this clear, distinct thought that flashed through my mind when I said that. Why are you allowing God to, I mean, God, why are you allowing this to happen and everything. Why are you torturing? Now I know down deep inside God's not the one doing the torturing. But at that point I was mad and I was and everything and I was like why are you doing this? And the distinct thought flashed through my mind isn't that what you do to my son? Every time you get mad, every time you lose your temper, every little sin you commit you're torturing my son. Now I went up that hill, shaking my fist at heaven and yelling at the top of my lungs, just mad. And I came back down that hill, crying my eyes out. It threw me for a loop for him to t say that to me. And I don't think our people understand that. Trenton, from time to time, as he was nearing death, he would say things that at that point in time didn't make a lot of sense. And I literally, at first I thought he was literally beginning to lose his mind. Now looking back, I don't think he was losing his mind. I think it was God telling me stuff. Trenton talked about seeing wheels and he said he could see light through the wheels. Now looking back, I really believe that Trenton was seeing Ezekiel's wheels. But when he said that, he said he could see light through the wheels. And when he said that, he pointed out toward the driveway. Now at this point, he couldn't see, but he knew which direction the driveway was and he pointed out toward the driveway. And he said he could see light through the wheels. That immediately made us think back to our truck. A few years ago, our truck was having all kinds of trouble. It's still having all kinds of trouble, but at that point it was having all kinds of trouble. Little squeaks and squawks and rattles and all kinds of noises. And I knew everything was going wrong on the truck, but I didn't have the money to fix it, and so we just kept driving it. And my wife literally told me, she said, I think God's holding this truck together. After a while, I managed to get enough money, I decided, you know, it's been a long time since the brakes were serviced on this thing. I'm sure the brakes need something. So I decided I'd replace the brakes. So I got the, got the supplies and I went to fix the brakes and I pulled the back wheel off. And when I pulled the back wheel off, what originally had been about a three or four piece brake system came out in about 20 pieces. God had literally been holding that truck together. So when Trenton said that, he could see light through the wheels. What do we know light is? It's truth. It's understanding. So he could see light through the wheels. And it was interesting because when he said that, he said, we'll understand it later. And this has literally been our experience. Because after he died, I started getting an understanding of what was going on.
And the, those tires on our truck literally, to me, were showing what happened to Trenton because God held that truck together until its work was done and then it fell apart in my hands. And that's what happened to Trenton. God held him together until his work was done and then he literally fell apart in my hands. Another thing Trenton said was, put me under the ground. Put me under the ground. He wanted to be put under the ground. I was like, why would you, you know, what's wrong with you? You don't want to be put under the ground. Now looking back, and I don't have any proof for this, it's just my thoughts, but I believe that God showed him the resurrection. And I believe that he saw himself coming out of the ground. Trenton's body began breaking down and falling apart from all the drug poisons that had been pumped into him on June 6, 2013. This is when his body literally started breaking down. Now, does June 6 ring any bells with you? Well, this gets really significant because June 6 is exactly 150 years to the day from June 6, 1863. Do you know what happened on June 6, 1863? June 6, 1863 is when Ellen White was given the vision of the dangers of the use of drug medication. Trenton literally started falling apart from drugs 150 years to the very day from Ellen White's vision on the use of drugs. Now Trenton actually died on Sunday, which was June 9, three days later. So in my mind, after all of this had taken place and I started realizing some of the significance, I was like, three days later, after this vision, I wonder what three days would be. And then I thought, well, you know, a day for a year. I wonder what three years would be. So I, th I thought, well, you know, three years after 1863, it's 1866. Just for curiosity's sake, I typed in 1866 in the Ellen White search engine and I got a whole bunch of hits and almost all of the hits, not all of them, but almost all of the hits for 1866 were all on the health message and the dangers of drug medication. This is one of those quotes. Councils on Diets and Foods. God has formed laws which govern our constitutions, and these laws which he has placed in our being are divine, and for every transgression there is affixed a penalty which must sooner or later be realized. The majority of diseases which the human family have been and still are suffering under, they have created by ignorance of their own organic laws. They seem indifferent in regard to the matter of health and work perseveringly to tear themselves to pieces and when broken down and debilitated in body and mind, send for the doctor and drug themselves to death. When I went back through all these quotes from 1866, 1866 was extremely significant because the Western Health Reform Institute which is the forerunner of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, was opened in 1866, marking a new era in Seventh-day Adventist history. Here's one of the other quotes from 1866. Make use of the remedies that God has provided. Pure air, sunshine, and the intelligent use of water are beneficial agents in the restoration of health. But the use of water is considered too laborious. It is easier to employ drugs than it is to use natural remedies. Many parents substitute drugs for judicious nursing. Now that was just toying with the idea, you know, a day for a year, three days after Trenton started breaking down. And that's how I got to that. But if you go back and you look at this, 150 years to the day Trenton starts breaking down, three days later, that gives you 153. Now, does that number ring a bell with anybody? Well, this number rang a bell with me because I had read a story in the Bible that used this number. And I'm extremely curious about numbers because I don't think God ever wastes his breath. And when there's a number in the Bible, it always has significance. The fish in the net. Remember the story where Christ was on the shore 
And he told them to throw the net on the other side of the ship. And they caught 153 fish. Now I've read that story numerous times. And I always wondered, 153. Why 153? Why not 150? 140? 160? Why 153? That just, you know. But it has to have significance, you know, because God used it. Well, this linked, in my mind, it linked that story with Trenton's death. And I'm like, okay, God, what are you trying to tell me? Now, I'm not saying that the 153 is talking about Trenton, but God was using it, in my mind, to teach me something. You'll remember in that story that Christ was on the shore and he told them to cast the net on which side of the ship? The right side. What side was that? Jesus had a purpose in bidding them to cast their net on the right side of the ship. On that side, he stood upon the shore. That was the side of faith. If they labored in connection with him, his divine power, combining with their human effort, they could not fail of success. So here is a story that's talking about them taking the net and casting it on the right side, which she says is the side of faith. This is righteousness by faith and it's on the right side of a ship now what's a ship represent in the bible it represents a church you know we understand that a woman represents a church and if you look in proverbs 31 14 it's talking about the virtuous woman and it says she is like the merchant's ships so a ship is a church if it's a good ship it's a good church. If it's a bad ship, it's a bad church. So here are the disciples, God's people, in a ship, in a church, and they're told to cast on the right side. Now, what's the right side of the church? The medical missionary work is to be to the work of the church as the right arm to the body. The third angel goes forth proclaiming the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The medical missionary work is the gospel in practice. All lines of work are to be harmoniously blended in giving the invitation, come for all things are now ready. So here is a story that links the medical missionary work with righteousness by faith. And God was using this, linking it with my son's death. And I'm like, okay, God, I, it's obvious that you're trying to tell me. You're trying to reveal something to me. Now, that was just one connection. But as you know, God doesn't work in ones. He always doubles it or more. So the morning after Trenton died, I was pondering in my mind. I was thinking, okay, what am I going to use for a tombstone? And in my mind, I'm thinking of a, a typical tombstone. You know, the granite thing, all the engraving on it. And I'm like, I can't afford that, you know, this, what am I going to use for a tombstone? And while I'm sitting there pondering this, the picture of a stone flashed through my mind, just as vivid as, it, as I'm looking at this computer here. And that stone I haven't thought of in seven years. That stone I've had in my family for four generations. This is a picture of that stone. Just a plain, ordinary looking rock, huh? But it's not ordinary. This stone belonged to my great grandpa and he passed it on to my grandpa who passed it on to my mother who passed it on to me. I'm the fourth generation. And whenever I would have passed it on to Trenton, he would have been the fifth generation. So this is the fourth generation. What makes this stone so significant is that I brought it out here when we moved out from North Carolina on the truck because I wanted to keep it and I just as we we're unloading the truck I just threw it over to the side which is significant in and of itself and it was all grown up in grass I would pretty much totally forgotten about it hadn't thought of it in seven years but this stone flashed through my mind and when this stone flashed through my mind I distinctly heard the thought I want you to use this stone as his headstone this stone came from that building. Do you recognize that? That's Washington, New Hampshire. 
That's the first Seventh-day Adventist church. And that is a stone from the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now you'll notice that this stone is wedge-shaped. It's smaller on this end than it is on this end. Hold that thought in mind. Okay, so we went out and we started digging the grave. And as we were digging the grave, we dug up two cicadas that were immature. They didn't have their wings yet. I just, you know, threw them over into the woods and left them alone and everything. And a little bit later, we heard this clicking noise and we discovered a cicada with wings on a tree branch up above the grave. So in the process of digging Trenton's grave, we found three cicadas in Idaho. in Idaho, which those of you who know what cicadas are realize that cicadas are in the eastern part of the United States. It's very rare to find cicadas out here. There's only a couple of species that are out in this area. I've searched on the internet and you don't see them much out here, but we found three in the process of digging Trenton's grave. So, hold that thought. We kept digging and all of us were digging, but Daniel was working on his own little corner of the hole and he was digging and digging and digging and digging and he dug out a big rock and he pulled the rock out and we were, wow, Daniel, you really dug up a big rock. And so he rolled it out and rolled it over to the side and we kept digging. We got the hole dug. We buried Trenton, got Trenton in the hole, got it covered back up. And I put the wedge-shaped stone from the first Seventh-day Adventist church at the head. And we're like looking, okay, what else are we going to do here? And Susanna and I got the same thought pretty much at the same time. Let's use the rock that Daniel dug up as the foot stone. It'll be something special because he was having a pretty rough time with his brother's death. And so we said, let's put that up there. Well, he couldn't pick it up himself and carry it back up the hill. So Rachel went over and picked it up for him and helped him carry it up and put it in place. And we got it all in place. And I stepped back to look at our finished product. And when I stepped back to look at the finished product, it was like God suddenly just started sticking pieces in place. It was all these thoughts started flashing through my mind and I was like, look what we just did. At the head of the image is the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist church that is a stone that's shaped like a wedge. What's the wedge that is at the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist church? The health work is the entering wedge. When the third angel's message is received in its fullness, health reform will be given its place. Then the right arm will serve the body. Why is it a stone? God has given our sanitariums an opportunity to set in operation a work that would be as a stone, instinct with life, growing as it is moved by an invisible hand. Let this mystic stone be set in operation. If ever a place needed medical missionary work, it is the southern field. So here she's saying that the medical missionary work is the mystic stone. So here's this grave, and you've got this mystic stone up here at the head, the medical missionary work, the health work, the wedge that was given at the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist church. But that's not all, because at the foot of the image, you have the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands that was dug up by Daniel, and it strikes the image at the foot. And you just saw the quote where Ellen White talks about the medical missionary work as the mystic stone. The stone that was cut out without hands, which smote the image at his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. While representing the kingdoms of this earth, the image that was revealed to Nebuchadnezzar also fitly represented deterioration of religion. 
So here you can see the deterioration of the kingdoms of the world in this image. You can see the deterioration of the Christian church, which later became the papacy portrayed. You can also see the deterioration of the Protestant church. It began at the Reformation and it's disintegrated. You can also see the deterioration of the Seventh-day Adventist church in this image. So at the foundation, when we were given the health message, we're at this head of gold. But where are we today? We're down here in the feet of iron and clay, the fourth generation. And what is it that hits here? It's the medical missionary work. It's this work being reinstituted and it destroys this deteriorated religion. Now, according to Daniel, the stone that hit the image on the feet, what was its characteristics? It was cut out of the mountain without hands, but what did it do? It grew and became a mountain and filled the whole earth. This is a picture of the grave. And if you'll notice, in a straight line, there's stones that grow in size until it fills this whole mountain that this grave is resting on. So Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2 literally is shown in Trenton's death where he was buried. And out of 20 acres on which to bury my son, why there? And that would just happen to be where the stone was that Daniel dug up. It just happened to be in a straight line with those. Remember, I don't believe in coincidence. So God was trying to teach me something. Okay. Now, when Trenton was still alive, he liked to do 3D modeling on the computer. And he would work and he'd make these pictures. And he, he really, that was his thing. He, he was basically our computer expert. So he was always making these pictures, but he also would spend a lot of time getting on the internet and going to the sites that dealt with the 3D modeling, which I don't understand any of, but you know, they've got blogs and stuff and people that are into that, they, they swap questions and answers and all this kind of stuff. And they use pen names for themselves. They don't usually call themselves by their real name. They have a username or whatever else. Well, the name that Trenton used when he was on the computer like that, he called himself the timer. He called himself the timer. Okay, so the next morning, after we would gotten Trenton buried, we were in the house and we had gotten Trenton's computer out because I wanted to save all the pictures that he made and get all the files that he had. And as we're going through those files on the computer, we discovered a file that he had downloaded while he had been in the hospital. And I don't know if it was named this when he got it off the internet or if he named the file on the computer himself. But the file on his computer is titled Hidden Treasures. The interesting thing about this is that what this file is, it's a little video clip. And it's a video clip of a Moody Science classic. Trenton really wanted this certain episode of this Moody Science classics. And he looked, he spent all kinds of time in the hospital trying to find that video on the internet where he could buy a copy. He wanted to order a copy so we'd have a copy of it because he wanted to see it. And he looked and looked and looked and looked and he couldn't find one anywhere. The only thing he could find of that video was this clip. And the interesting thing about this is I went back after his death, after we found all this stuff, I was like, I want to see the whole video. So I typed in the title on the search engine. And it's all over the internet. You can buy a copy from anywhere you want. So why would God cover up all those copies on the internet so that the only thing Trenton could get is this little clip? God wanted that clip on his computer to teach me that there's more to his death than just me. Now remember, the day before, we just put my son, the timer, in the ground so we're dealing with the state of the dead. And in the process of putting the timer in the ground, we found some cicadas. Today, man is frantically searching for a solution to his problem. But isn't the first step a recognition of what the problem is? This leads to the rather startling conclusion that man's normal state is to be asleep. 
He's awake only when the alarm clock in his head is ringing. As soon as the sun goes down on the appointed day, millions and millions of cicada alarm clocks go off all over the eastern half of the United States. The Moody Science Classics video series presents a stimulating level of science mixed with the teachings of Dr. Erwin Moon of the Moody Institute of Science. Throughout this 20 video series, Dr. Moon presents the theories of science while teaching solid biblical truth. But here again, we can't choose the result. It is fixed by the eternal law of God, who says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You think that's a coincidence? The chance that I would see this clip on Trenton's computer the day after I bury my dead son, the timer, in the ground with cicadas is astronomical. There's no way you're ever going to convince me that was coincidence. So at this point, I was convinced that God was trying to teach me something important. And it had something to do with Trenton. Now, this is a picture that Trenton modeled. He actually modeled two of these pictures. And as you can see in here, you have the hourglass where the sand is almost run out. And the earth is surrounded by this foggy mist. And as I was looking at these pictures, I realized that they're telling a story. Men and women are wondering in the mist and fog of error. The reason why so many are groping their way in the fog of error is that they are taking the assertions of men instead of searching the Word of God for themselves. Notwithstanding the repeated urgent warnings God has given, many have been turned away from their original faith and are lost in the fog of error. In that first picture that he modeled, you had a timer that was connected to the earth, and the earth is surrounded by fog, which she says is error. Now the second picture that Trenton modeled was this one. Now the timer has been disconnected from the earth, and the fog is disappearing, and the earth is circled with beams of orange light. Ezekiel 1, 27 and 28. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire, round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So, now the Bible doesn't use the word orange, but it talks about amber as the color of fire. So that's orange. And it links the orange with the glory of the Lord. And I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel and to give power and force to his message. Great power and glory were imparted to the angel, and as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. Now this is the fourth angel. This is the Revelation 18 angel, and who is that? We're told that's Christ. This is the glory of the Lord that lightens the whole earth. So here, when you compare the two pictures, we see that something to do with Trenton's death, the timer being disconnected from the earth, begins the process of dispelling that fog and starting the fourth angel's message. Now this is, I'm not trying to say this is how it is to everybody, but this is what God is teaching me in this and everything. So he's linking the death of my son, in my mind, to the fourth angel's message to the medical missionary work, to righteousness by faith, and he's doing all this in object lessons. Stuff that, that's in the natural world, stuff that I would have never in my wildest dreams put together. Okay, so a few weeks after Trenton had died, we took a trip to South Dakota. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Black Hills or not, but while we were there, 
we went to an archaeological dig site where they're uncovering all these mammoth skeletons. And it was basically like a giant mammoth graveyard. And so we're, we took a tour of this place, and the tour guide is taking us through and showing us all this stuff, telling us all about the bones and all this kind of stuff. And as you can imagine, it's all evolution. Their theory is that this was a sinkhole, an underground river collapsed, and the ground sunk in and formed a sinkhole. And the mammoths would come down into that sinkhole to drink from the pool of water at the bottom, and then they couldn't climb back out, and so they all just stayed down there and they died. And this is how all the mammoth bones got down there, which of course we know they got there at the flood. But then they came to a skeleton and they said, now this has confused us because here's all these mammoths that got trapped in the hole and died supposedly. And then they find the skeleton of a giant bear. And it just totally blew their minds because a bear can climb. So why couldn't a bear climb out of the hole? How did the bear get trapped down there with the mammoths? And so they've got this exhibit and this skeleton of a big bear. And so we're all talking amongst ourselves, kind of laughing, you know. <laughs> you know, God took that bear and stuck it in that hole just to blow evolution out of the water. And so while we're there, we're taking pictures of all the exhibits and, you know, just enjoying ourselves. Wasn't linking anything with my son at all. So we leave there and we come back home and in the mailbox was a package from the International Star Registry. Come to find out the Make-A-Wish Foundation had submitted Trenton's name to the International Star Registry and they named a star after Trenton. They put Trenton's star in Ursa Major, which we all most often call the Big Dipper. This was pretty much one of the only constellations that Trenton could identify. Ursa Major, which means the Big Bear. Wait a minute, we just saw a big bear in South Dakota. And now I get home and there's a star named after Trenton in the constellation, the big bear. Now, as I was looking at this, Daniel 12, two and three flashed through my mind. Daniel 12, two and three says, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever now the interesting thing about trenton's star here in this constellation there's 12 constellations that come up and move across the sky and go down. And the order that they come up and go down tells the great controversy. And each of those 12 has three other constellations that travel with it. And they're called deacons. So you have the main constellation and then three deacons that move with it. Now the interesting thing about here in this constellation, in the Greek mythology, this is called the big bear. But if you go back and you look at the Hebrew and the Aramaic, this constellation wasn't a bear. It's called the greater sheepfold. In Hebrew culture, this constellation literally means the collection of the redeemed. Genesis 1.14 says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, if you look at these constellations in the order that they come up and they go down, the next to the last constellation is called Cancer. And Trenton's constellation is the second deacon of Cancer. I wanted to know what the word deacon meant. So I looked up the word deacon, and you know what the word deacon means? It means breaking of. So Trenton's constellation literally means the breaking of cancer. The next constellation after the big bear comes up is Leo the lion. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's the second coming. Trenton's star has a magnitude of 14.1. And if you calculate Trenton's age in decimals, it was 14.1 when he died. Just another coincidence, I'm sure. Now, 
The interesting thing about this is all these different things had taken place and I'm sitting there in the house at my table looking across the room and on my wall I've got hanging up the charts that I'm sure some of you are familiar with. I don't know if you all are familiar, but this is the 1843 chart that William Miller had Joshua V. Himes print up. The next one, the middle one, is the 1850 chart, which was printed by Otis Nichols. And then the third one is the 1863 chart, which was printed by James White. And so I've got these three charts hanging on the wall, and I'm sitting there, just thinking about all these different things and stuff and I'm looking at those charts and all of a sudden it just flashed into my mind wait a minute there's a big bear on those charts I was thinking the image the big bear wait 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 and I walked over to the charts and I'm looking at them and I'm looking at that bear and then it hit me wait a second there was characteristics of that bear what are the characteristics of that bear? The bear is raised up on one side and he's got ribs in his mouth. And I'm like, oh, that reminds me of South Dakota. So I went back and I looked up the pictures on my computer from South Dakota and it took my breath away. There's a bear with a rib in its mouth. That was one of the exhibits. Now out of all the bones out of that hole they could have put in its mouth, they put a rib. There's the bear raised up on one side. See its shoulder blades? So I went back and I looked at this chart and that's when it started hitting me. If you realize that this image represents a deterioration of religion and we know that the beasts are paralleling these metals which means whatever the image represents these beasts also represent. Which means if this is a deterioration of religion this is a deterioration of religion. And when you start understanding this, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of this image. Who are we told is the head? With the nations, it's representing Babylon. But there's more meaning to this image than just that. We're told that Christ is the head and we are the body. Now Babylon is a counterfeit of Christ. So this image is representing both God's way, or what God is revealing anyway, to what the devil is doing. So here you have Christ, which is the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's the head of gold. And then you get to the body, which we're the body. And the first part of the body is the shoulders. Now there's actually a quote, and I'm not sure, I don't think I have it in here, but there's a quote where Ellen White talks about the body as the gospel. So not only does the body represent the church, it represents the gospel. But she also refers to the arm as the medical missionary work, the health message. So here's this image, and it begins, if you represent this as a timeline, with Christ at the head, and as it moves down, you get to the gospel, which is all united as one across here. This is one unit. But the further you go, suddenly there's a division that takes place. Now the arms are disconnected from the body. And this is what took place in our church. We were given the health message at the foundation, but as we progressed through time, the health message became separate from the gospel. They made two separate things out of it. But you'll notice in the image that even though it's separated, the chest and the arms are still silver. And silver represents God's law, represents God's people, represents a whole bunch of stuff. So they're still silver, which means they're still good. They're not, they're not contaminated, they're just split up. And the arms are what do the work. You ever try to do anything without your arms? You don't get much accomplished, do you? So if all you've got is the gospel and no right arm to do any work, so you'll notice that in the image, they're all working together. 
even though they're suddenly separated they're all working together but then you come down and you get to brass now what's the brass the brass is Greece that's Greek philosophy that's higher criticism the historical critical the historical grammatical the Plato philosophy when that gets incorporated suddenly the arms come to an end now it's all back to one unit and we'll explore this a little bit later but the modern medical system is higher criticism it's Greek philosophy so here you have portrayed in this image how the medical missionary work comes to an end and the modern medical system gets established under Greek philosophy and then as it progresses on down it has a division in the body which is the gospel and suddenly the gospel is divided into two parts two legs law and love law and grace legalism liberalism and what does Ellen White say you can't divide the two they go together as one but as you go down as the church is deteriorating they separate those two aspects of the gospel into two separate parts and as it goes down it gets into pagan Rome and look at all the pagan traditions that we've incorporated into our church today and then as it goes further on down it becomes papal Rome and look at all the papal mindset that our church has today and it ends in the feet where everything disintegrates nobody can cleave to one another what do we see in the church today we're in the iron and clay everybody's fighting everybody else nobody can cleave to anything it's just a big mess so I'm sitting here looking at this and all these thoughts are coming to my mind. I'm like, Look at what all is there. I never saw this before. And then it hit me. The medical missionary work, the mystic stone that strikes the image at the feet and it grows and fills the whole earth. It's God restoring what was at the beginning. The medical missionary work that we should have taken at the beginning and gone forward with it and had it grow from that point, we dropped it. We dropped the ball. And so at the end, God is reinstituting that, bringing it back in, and that's what destroys the image. So if you understand that, then you understand that in order for God to get us ready to go to heaven, He has to take us in reverse order back up that image. So as you go back up this image, first you get rid of the papal mindset. You reject the papal mindset. Then through reform you get rid of the pagan traditions that have been incorporated into the church then you rejoin the legalism and the liberalism the law and the love the law and grace obedience and grace you rejoin those two aspects into one gospel then you reject higher criticism the Greek philosophy and all of the stuff that goes with it and when you reject that then the medical missionary work comes back into existence and when the medical missionary work comes back into existence then you reunite it to the gospel into one unit and then you're back to the head the second coming of Christ and if you look at this the bear which is where Trenton was placed in the big bear it's the next event to the lion of the tribe of Judah it's the same thing in the constellations the bear comes up and then the lion Ephesians 4 13 through 15 till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and then later on it says but speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things which is the head even Christ so there in the image you can see how we are to go back up that image we're to grow up unto the full stature of the head Jesus Christ that's the growing up process that we saw in the sanctuary now if you look at this who does that represent Medo Persia Medo Persia was what brought about the fall of Babylon 
Who was the leader of the Medes and the Persians? Cyrus. So here you've got Cyrus leading the Medes and the Persians, bringing about the fall of Babylon. Now the interesting thing about it is, is that in Isaiah, it refers to Cyrus as a type of Christ. God actually 150 years before Cyrus was born said, Cyrus is my anointed. Cyrus is a type of Christ. So here is Christ, the medical missionary that brings about the fall of Babylon by doing what? What did he do to bring about the fall of Babylon? He dried up the Euphrates River. And how did he dry up the Euphrates River? He diverted the river. Now I'm sitting here thinking of all of this and wondering what is the connection? All right, we have the medical missionary that is diverting the water from Babylon to bring about the fall of Babylon. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this has to do with water. The water is the people. So the Euphrates River is representing people. The people are what are feeding Babylon. It's what's supplying Babylon with its life blood. And in order for Cyrus, the medical missionary, Christ, to bring about the fall of Babylon, he has to divert the people somewhere else. And so I'm sitting here thinking of all this, and I'm thinking about the bear, and South Dakota, this hole full of mammoth skeletons, and all these thoughts are just running through my mind. And picture, if you will, Babylon as a mammoth system of medicine. Babylon, a mammoth system of the pharmaceutical industry. So it has all these poisons, these counterfeit cures that they're pumping into people. And all the people in the world are flocking to the pharmacies and to the medical system. And their money is what is supplying that industry. It's what's making it grow. Now, as I was contemplating these thoughts, I started doing some research and I found a book. It's called Great Moments of Medicine. And I'm flipping through there and it's got all these paintings that this guy painted showing the different way marks in the evolution or whatever you call it of modern medicine. What do you see in that picture? This is a painting of the founding meeting of the American Medical Association, May 7, 1847. 250 delegates met among exhibit cases and the ancient bones of a mammoth or mastodon in the hall of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So here, underneath the bones of a mammoth, they're signing the papers founding the American Medical Association. Just coincidence, I'm sure. So here's just one more connection between Trenton and that bear being in a hole with mammoth skeletons. I wanted to know what Ellen White had to say about mammoths. You ever done a study in the writings of Ellen White on the word mammoth? It's a fascinating study. The very name of witchcraft is now held in contempt. The claim that men can hold intercourse with evil spirits is regarded as a fable of the dark ages. But spiritualism, which numbers its converts by hundreds of thousands, yea, by millions, which has made its way into scientific circles, which has invaded the churches and has found favor in legislative bodies and even in the courts of kings, this mammoth deception is but a revival in the new disguise of the witchcraft condemned and prohibited of old. If you do a study through the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy, she talks over and over and over about deceptions as mammoth. She talks about spiritualism as being a mammoth deception. She talks about Romanism being a mammoth deception. She links mammoths with deceptions. So here is a bear in a hole filled with mammoth, and it's connected to Cyrus, the medical missionary, bringing about the fall of a mammoth institution, a mammoth deception. But notice that in this picture, this deception is just one mammoth. There's a bunch of mammoths. 
So I'm not saying that all those mammoths are the medical institution. The medical institution is just one of those mammoths. I already talked about how this river was supplying Babylon. It's what's feeding Babylon. So in order for Cyrus to get into Babylon, he had to divert the people. And if you understand that Babylon is representing the medical sorcery, if you will, that we have today, in order to get into Babylon to dry up the Euphrates, he had to divert the people to another way. The true method for healing the sick is to tell them of the herbs that grow for the benefit of man. Scientists have attached large names to these simplest preparations, but true education will lead us to teach the sick that they need not call in a doctor any more than they would call in a lawyer. They can themselves administer the simple herbs if necessary. To educate the human family that the doctor alone knows all the ills of infants and persons of every age is false teaching. And the sooner we as a people stand on the principles of health reform, the greater will be the blessing that will come to those who will do true medical work. There is work to be done in treating the sick with water and teaching them to make the most of sunshine and physical exercise. Thus, in simple language, we may teach the people how to preserve health, how to avoid sickness. This is the work our sanitariums are called upon to do. This is true science. Now, I don't know if you remember some of the quotes where she talks about higher criticism as false science. In other words, what higher criticism is to the Bible, the modern medical institution is to the physical body. It's higher criticism. So, in the case of the Bible, what you have is the modern scholars that say, you can't understand the Bible, you're just a common person. You don't have the training, you don't understand the original language or the Bible culture. You just come to me, the, the scholar, the educated one, and I'll give you my writings and I'll teach you what the Bible means. In the medical world, you have the doctors saying, you're just a common person. You can't understand disease. You can't understand how to fix your problems. You just come to us and we'll mix up a magic potion and we'll give this to you and help you cure your disease. It's the same thing. Okay, let's go back to the sanctuary structure where you've got God's way and the devil's way. New Jerusalem, Babylon, and this river. Each city is sitting on a river. In order for Cyrus, the medical missionary, Christ, to get into Babylon and slay the king, Belshazzar, who represents Satan, he had to divert the water. So in order for him to divert the water, he diverted the water a different direction. What you have in the history of the fall of Babylon is a demonstration of the medical missionary work taking the people that are flowing this way and turning them around and making them go that direction. Diverting the water so that the Euphrates would dry up. Notice that there's two gates here. You have the knowledge of the truth and you have life. But now the devil counterfeits these. You've got the knowledge of good and evil. So he's taking the knowledge of the truth and he's adding a little evil to it. So you have good and evil. And then his counterfeit of life is death. The Garden of Eden was not only Adam's dwelling, but his schoolroom. As in the school, so in the school of earth today, two trees are planted. The tree of life, which bears the fruit of true education, and the tree of knowledge, yielding the fruit of science, falsely so called. So in that picture, here you've got the true education. You've got the truth, the first gate. Remember Cyrus, he had to go through two gates to get into the heart of Babylon. So here you've got the first gate. In God's way, it's knowledge of the truth. In the devil's way, it's science falsely so called. It's false education. The second gate, which in God's way is life, in the devil's way is a counterfeit of the tree of life. So what is the devil's counterfeit of the tree of life? 
From beginning to end, the crime of tobacco using, of opium, and drug medication had its origin in perverted knowledge. It is through plucking and eating of poisonous fruit, through the intricacies of names that the common people do not understand, that thousands and ten thousands of lives are lost. This great knowledge, supposed by men to be so wonderful, God did not mean that man should have. They are using the poisonous productions that Satan himself has planted to take the place of the tree of life, whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. Men are dealing in liquors and narcotics that are destroying the human family. So here she specifically says, I mean, she's got other things in there, the tobacco using, the liquors, but when you go back and you research those, they're all coming from the same source as the narcotics, the opium, morphine. It's all from the pharmaceutical industry. Go back and trace the money. Who owns the liquor stores? It can be traced back to the Vatican. Let us all do everything in our power to turn from and reject Satan's false methods and work in harmony with the medical missionary, Christ, to get that water diverted from Babylon so that we can all go home and stand on the sea of glass. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for the opportunity to go through some of your wonderful truth that you've given to us. Please help it to sink in and make an impression that will last and help each one of us to study more of your word and to draw closer to you and Give us wisdom that we need in order to work in harmony with you to help get that river diverted and be ready to go home to heaven with you. Please go with us now. Give us a safe night's rest and wake us refreshed in the morning ready for a new day. And ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.